Okay, thank you, Micah. And now, so we're on Romans 8, 5. And so the first point... So Romans 8, 5 through 8, characteristics of the mind set on the flesh and the mind set on the spirit. So as a Christian, you have two choices, flesh or spirit. And we're going to see in verses 5 through 8, it's more of a past tense discussion on it. But still, the concept applies. So point 1, Romans 8, 5. And let's just read that again. So Romans 8, 5. Notice, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the flesh. Of the spirit. So for those who are according to the flesh, those who are unsaved, they set the thing or they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But notice those who are in the spirit, they set the things or they set their mind on the things of the spirit. And also I kind of made an error there, right? This is speaking more of us as Christians, but also there's kind of a past tense dis- discussion too. So notice if we're in the flesh, we set our mind according to the flesh. If we're in the spirit, we set our mind according to the spirit. So point one, Romans eight five. Paul contrasts their life influenced by the flesh of the, or the sin nature with a life influenced by the Holy Spirit. And let's go to Galatians 5, 17. And let's read verse 16 as well. So, and we've kind of discussed it before, but there's the flesh and there's the Holy Spirit. And as a Christian, we have an option to either walk by the flesh, by sin, or walk by the Holy Spirit. And let's read Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17. And notice Paul speaking to Galatians, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. So as Christians, as we walk, right, there's a battle. There's the flesh, and there's the Spirit. It's a constant battle, right? There's one or the other, and they're at war with one another. So each of us as Christians, we have this battle within us. But notice verse 16. He says, walk by the Spirit. So if we walk by the Spirit, then we, then we will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So it's not walk by the flesh, you, you, or do not walk by the flesh, you'll be spiritual. It's saying walk by the Spirit, then you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So notice the focus is always back to the Spirit, back to God. And so walking by the Spirit, and I think essentially what that means, you know, it, it's, it's not the most clear all the time, but really it means walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, the power that He has so not walking in our own power, but walking in the power of the Holy Spirit that He has for us. And in light of that, we can now live out Romans 6, you know, the commandments of being dead to sin, alive unto God. We can live those out through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's, like, it's kind of like an energizer bunny, right? The Holy Spirit empowers us to now live out the Christian life, to now consider ourselves to be dead to sin and alive unto God. And of course, the power of the Holy Spirit, how great is that power? It's a perfect power, right? And we have that power within us. So the point is, walk by the Spirit, trust in His power, moving forward, not our own. And we're going to see that later on as well. So point A, Romans 8, 5a. For those who are according to the flesh, so unbelievers always live according to the flesh, that's their only recourse. Remember, once again, in Adam, only sin, only flesh. So unbelievers can only walk in the flesh. They cannot please God. And then point one, however... When believers present themselves to the sin nature, they are also walking according to the flesh, and the results are the same. So as Christians, we can walk as unbelievers, we can walk in the flesh, in the sin nature, and not be pleasing to God. And certainly, if you guys are honest in our lives, we do this a lot, right? We walk in the flesh. But the point is, we don't have to anymore. We now have the Holy Spirit. We now have all these cool identification truths in Jesus Christ. And point two, when believers walk according to their sin nature... They become worldly, carnal, and unspiritual in their behavior. So when we walk according to sin nature, as we're going to see later, it reaps only death. We become worldly, carnal, not like Christ, unspiritual in all our behaviors. And of course, as Christians, do we want to be unspiritual? Hopefully, that we, we don't want to be unspiritual. And so a lot of times, you see a Christian, but do they really act like a Christian? And a lot of times, that's us as well, right? We don't always act like Christians. And why? Because we're being led by the flesh, by the sin nature. We're not walking by faith through the Holy Spirit. And point B, Romans 8, 5b. So those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. So to set your mind on the things of the flesh means to occupy your thinking with the sinful desires of your sin nature. Point C, Romans 8, 5c. But those who are according to the, who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. By contrast, those believers 
who walk according to the Spirit, fill their minds with the things that please God. And so notice, the things that please God. Only in the Spirit can we please God. When we're walking according to the flesh, when we're allowing our sin nature to take control of us, we are not pleasing to God at all. And of course, we're actually reaping death, corruption, not good things. So now let's read Romans 8, verse 6. So notice verse 6. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. So notice if, we're, if our mind is set on the flesh, if we're walking by our sin nature, what does that equal? As we've said so many times before, does anyone know? Maybe. It equals death. But notice, on the other hand, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. And of course, in this life, Life and peace are good things, right? A lot of times, people in this world are trying to find life and peace, right? Peace is good. Everyone wants this, but they don't know where to find it, and that's because the only way where you can ever find life and peace in this life is through Jesus Christ. That's the only way that you can find life and peace, and it's through walking by the Spirit, not, not in our own power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, point two, Romans 8, 6, a mind set on the flesh experiences carnal death, while a mind set on the Spirit enjoys life and peace. So point A, Romans 8, 6a, the mind set on the flesh is death. So death is a noun here, emphasizing the miserable state of the person who sets his or her mind on the flesh. He or she will live a pointless life, devoid of purpose, and without fruit. I think another thing, too, how we live, you know, we have a choice, right? Sin by the flesh or the Holy Spirit. How we live has eternal consequences, right? This isn't just something that, oh, just in this life, right? It has eternal consequences. Measures, and we're going to see that later, right? There is just this, this, of course, we are saved forever by believing in Jesus Christ, right? The gospel, right? He died, he was buried, and rose again. But how we live in our present walks, it has consequences. There's this idea of rewards that some Christians will not get as much rewards as others because they have not loved the appearing of Jesus Christ, right? So there's, there's eternal consequences to not following Jesus Christ. It's not just something, you know, do whatever. Everyone has the same exact reward. There are different rewards in heaven. And so as Christians, we may have different rewards depending on how faithfully we follow the Lord in our lives. And hopefully we will see that following the Lord is a very important thing to do. And, and, and we don't do these things to gain rewards, although that's kind of part of it. First of all, we follow the Lord because we love Him. And then as a side note, we also gain rewards. So it's important to realize that how we live in our lives, it has impact, right? It affects others, but also there is eternal ramifications for how we live the Christian life. And if we see that, if we really focus on that, that'll help us as well, right? Focus on the future. Point B, Romans 8, 6. But the mind set on the, set on the Spirit is life and peace. The mind of the believer who walks according to the Holy Spirit is filled with life and peace. And once again, life and peace are a very good thing. And peace is through walking by the Holy Spirit. Point 1, life in this context, implies real life. The result of walking according to the Spirit is abundant life, fruitful life, amazing life, intense life, beautiful life. You know, all these adjectives, it's abundant life. It's a good life. So the best life, I've said this before, the best life you can ever live is one dedicated to Jesus Christ and following Him and His calling. That's the best life you can ever live, and I think Scripture is very clear on that. Everything else is death. So in Christ, through the Holy Spirit, walking by means of the Holy Spirit, that is abundant life. And then point two, if you walk according to the Spirit, you will be at peace. Most believers long to enjoy true inner peace. Now let's go to John 14, verse 27. So John 14, verse 27. And then if someone can turn to John 16, 33. And after I read 14, 27, if someone could read that one. So John 14, 27, and then John 16, 33. And I'll read 14, 27. So verse 27. So Jesus is speaking, and he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. So notice... The peace that Jesus Christ gives, it's from Him, not of the world. So the only peace we could ever have really comes 
from Jesus Christ. And of course, we see that in the Bible. You know, the whole point of, I guess, Romans 1, 7, right? He's trying to give them grace and peace. And so if we go through the Bible, if we see who Jesus Christ is, that's what truly will give us peace. And if someone can read uh, John sixteen thirty three as well. Thank you, JG. And notice, so that in who? In me, Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, you may have peace. In the world, right, life isn't fun. A lot of bad things happen. You may have tribulation, but through Jesus Christ, you will have peace. And notice, but take courage, I have overcome the world. So the man we have peace in, he has overcome the world. And so if we have peace in him, that is a perfect peace. That is an amazing peace that we can really count on. So point three, and let's go back to Romans 8 and read... Verse 7. So notice verse 7, Romans 8. So because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. So, speaking of probably unbelievers and believers, right? If your mind is set on the flesh... You cannot please God. It's not even able to do so. You are hostile towards God. So when we're walking by our flesh, or even an unbeliever who is in sin, has not been saved, they are hostile towards God. They cannot please God is really the point. So because the mindset of the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. So everything about the sin nature is contrary to God. Right? There's sin, there's God, they can never come together. And so when we walk by sin, we are not walking by the Spirit. We are not in fellowship with God. We are actually far from God. So point A, the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God. Christians who walk by the flesh are resistant to God. They often blame God for being distant or silent, whereas the real problem is their own carnality. So a lot of times, yeah, people, life kind of starts to beat them down, or they're, you know, or they're sinning, and, you know, bad things happen, and they want to blame God. But one thing that we can take away from this, don't ever blame God God is perfect, blame yourself. So when things are going bad, and sometimes, you know, God uses trials to make us better, but sometimes when we're having issues, right, don't blame God, blame yourself for the problems you have. Because God never created those problems, you probably created those problems yourself. So don't blame God for the issues in your life. Point B, the mindset on the flesh does not subject itself to the law of God. Those who walk by the flesh are not submissive to God's word. They do not believe what God says, nor do what he wants. Point C, the mind set on the flesh is not even able to obey God's law. It is impossible for the believer who walks by means of the sin nature to please God. Isaiah 64, 6, right? We've seen all our deeds, are, 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 all our righteousness is filthy rags, right? So if we're walking by the flesh, we cannot even please God. So the only way as Christians that we can ever please God is to walk by means of the Holy Spirit, trusting in His power, not our own power. And point D, when we lack peace or we feel far from God, do not want to pray or experience multiple or experience multiple broken relationships, we are most certainly walking according to the flesh and not according to the Spirit. Christians who walk by the flesh are cold towards God. Now let's read Romans 8.8. 8. So the last part of this section. I'm actually doing two, so anyways. <laughs> Verse 8. And notice, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So if you're in the flesh either as an unbeliever or as a Christian walking according to your sin nature, you cannot please God whatsoever. So this statement is talking specifically about those who have not believed in Jesus Christ. Those who are in the flesh are unbelievers. Unbelievers are totally unable to please God. Right? It's not possible. Point A, Romans 7, 5 says, For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. So the only thing we ever did as unsafe people was bear fruit for death. We could not please God whatsoever. And then point B, even though this statement does not refer to believers, believers can sadly choose to walk according to the flesh and cease to please God just the same. And once again, as Christians, right, we have a choice. We have a choice. Which choice will you guys make? Will it be to walk by the flesh, the sin nature, or will it be to walk by the Holy Spirit? And hopefully we will see the Holy Spirit leads to life, and that is far better than walking by the flesh. And as we've seen before, walking by the flesh, you know, it's, it's totally contrary to who we are now in Jesus Christ. It makes 
no sense. It's like if I went back to high school, you know? Why would I do that? That makes no sense, right? We've moved on from that. We no longer have to do that, guys. So it's important to really realize that. We no longer have to. So because we don't have to, why would we go back to it? Instead, let's walk by the Holy Spirit. Let's consider ourselves to be alive unto God. And in light of that, present our members as slaves to righteousness, right? We have a choice. Hopefully, all of us will make the right choice going forward. Count on faith to what he did on the cross, that we have died to sin. And now the Holy Spirit allows us to walk in that in a successful fashion. So now let's read verses, um, let's just read verse 9. So Romans 8, verse 9. So notice, we've talked about believer, or people in the flesh, and now we're going to talk about people in the Spirit. And the Spirit, once again, is far better. And let's read verse 9. However, so speaking of us believers, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So all of us in this room, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, what does it say? We are in the Spirit. So the proof that we are saved, that we have believed in Jesus Christ, is the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And all of us, if we've put our faith in Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. So point D, Romans 8, 9 through 11, the believer is in the Spirit. So point 1, Romans 8, 9a, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. So believers are described as being in the Spirit rather than in the flesh. So all of us in this room, if we put our faith once again in Jesus Christ, we are in the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Point 2, Romans 8, 9b, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So all believers have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. Every single believer, right, the Holy Spirit seals us as we see in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. So point three, Romans eight, nine, C. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So if we don't have the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? That we are not a Christian, that we do not belong to Jesus Christ or to God. So any person who does not possess the Holy Spirit does not belong to Christ, period. Now let's read verse 10. And let's read verse 10 through 11. So Romans 8, 10 through 11. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And so verse 10.4, If Christ dwells in you by means of the Holy Spirit, even though your physical body is subject to death due to sin, your human spirit is alive because you have been born Again, so the Holy Spirit, right? It gives us life. Now, point five, Romans eight eleven. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through His Spirit who dwells in you. So, when we see this, it could be talking about a future resurrection, or it could be talking about a present tense life that the Holy Spirit gives to us. So, this verse could be speaking about our future resurrection, but in this context, we believe. It is speaking about the present enabling of the Spirit. And notice, once again, we see identification once again. So if the Spirit who raised Jesus Christ dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to you. Right? So the Holy Spirit gives us life. And that's really, once again, being identified with Jesus Christ as we see again. So the Holy Spirit gives us life. And then point true, or point A, it is true that, the, that in the future, the Holy Spirit will resurrect every believer's mortal body. This will occur at the rapture. So certainly we know that in the future, all of us, if we've been saved, if we've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and His work on the cross, then we will be in heaven. And actually, we, we can say it right now. All of us right now, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we are in heaven at this moment, right? We're seated at the right hand of Jesus Christ. And so this is certainly true. So it could be that, but I think... And then here's another thing. It is also true that the Holy Spirit daily refreshes believers in our present physical bodies, giving us power for service. So it could be both. or I mean, it could be both, or it could be one or the other. Either or, it doesn't really matter how we take it. But I think here it's referring to the Holy Spirit inside us, giving us life to now live the Christian life, to give us power to be successful in our walks as Christians. So point C... So the same Holy Spirit who brought Jesus Jesus Christ to life presently lives within you to energize you for fruitful service. So the Holy Spirit is the power 
It's like I said before, it's the Energizer Bunny. You know, he beats the drum. It allows us, it's a battery. It gives us power to now fulfill the commandments in Romans 6, to be in dead to sin and alive unto God. The Holy Spirit is really the enabling power that allows us to now live for Christ, to fulfill really all the principles and all the commandments we see in Scripture. The Holy Spirit allows us to do that. It gives us the power to fulfill the commandments in Scripture. So now responsibility. Let's read verses 12, or verse 12. So verse 12, Romans 8. Notice, so then, brethren, we are not, or we are under obligation not to the flesh, so we're not obligated to follow the flesh, but to live according to, or to live according to the flesh. And then verse 13. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So notice, We don't have to. We're not under obligation to the flesh. And if we are, and if we walk by the flesh, what does that lead to? Death. And of course, death is not good. We do not want death. It's corruption. Point E, Romans 8, 12 through 17, your responsibility as a believer in Christ. Once again, we all have a responsibility to serve and to follow the Lord, and that's done through walking by means of the Holy Spirit. So point one, Romans 8, 12 through 14, So then, brethren, in light of the fact that the law of the Spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death, we should definitely choose to live according to the Spirit. Right? Definitely. It's so much greater to live according to the Spirit. You will have true life and peace if you're focused on the Spirit, if you're walking according to the means of the Holy Spirit. It's far greater. The rest is death. And as we talked about yesterday, you know, when you sin, maybe it feels good for a little bit, but afterwards, did anything really good come out of it? And of course, the answer is no, right? The Holy Spirit is far better. You know, John seven thirty eight. rivers of abundant life come flowing out of you, right? Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, walking by means of that is far better, and it's actually life. The rest is death, but through Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, there is life. So we should definitely choose to live according to the Holy Spirit. And point A, Romans eight twelve. So then, brethren, we're not under, under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, so as a believer, you have no obligation to live according to the flesh, be exploited by it, or, to, or, or, or forced to endure its horrible consequences. So we no longer have to go back to what the flesh has to offer, which of course is death. And then point one, many believers think they have no hope of ever changing. They imagine their sin nature is stronger than anyone else's sin nature. So a lot of times in theology and in, in preaching and going through the Bible, people will tell you, you cannot go against your sin nature. It's, you're doomed to sin, right? You have no power over that sin. And I'm here to tell you, and we've probably said it before, that that is completely untrue. As a Christian, you have power. You have the power of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit to conquer any sin, right? You're no longer a slave to that sin. You no longer have to follow that sin. You are free in regard to righteousness, right? And so when people say that, that's not true. You have power through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, to be able to conquer that sin, to, you know, to fight that sin in means of his power, right? There's no longer, there's no reason for us to really follow that sin. And point two, these believers are trapped in a Romans 7 type of existence. They try and fail, and eventually many even stop pursuing sanctification altogether. So if you think your life is hopeless, or if you think your Christian life is hopeless, you're going to stop trying, right? And a lot of times we need to realize that there is hope, and that hope is through Jesus Christ. Now point three, or point B, Romans eight thirteen b or A. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. So death awaits those who live according to the flesh. So, if we want to walk by the flesh, which we shouldn't want to, but if we do, what does that mean? That equals death. And we're going to see a few things that death can mean. But really the point is, death is not good, once again, So let's not walk according to flesh. But if we do, there is consequences to how we walk. So point one, the phrase, you must die, could be translated, you are about to die. Point two, when you walk according to the flesh, you proceed towards death. So when you're walking according to the flesh, it's like you're walking on a path that leads to death. Right? You're slowly making your way down to death. And so how? A, you may experience death of fellowship with the Lord and other believers through being separated from the body of Christ by church discipline. So you could experience death of fellowship with the Lord and also fellow believers. It could be that. And of course, I think the reason he just said death is because this can mean a lot of things. And so that's the point. 
It just means death, right? Bad things, and this can be seen in a, in a lot of different circumstances. Point B, through being handed over to Satan. So, we could be handed over to Satan, and I have no idea what that means, but let's go to 1 Timothy 1, 19 through 20. And that's kind of a scary thing, right? You read that, you're like, oh, what does that even mean, right? So let's go to 1 Timothy 1, 19 through 20. So Paul's speaking to Timothy in verse 19. He says, Keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. So they haven't kept the faith. They've fallen away. And then he says their name. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so they will be taught not to blaspheme. So these are Christians, right? So it's a warning to us as Christians. If we do not keep the faith, if we fall away, we will be handed over to Satan, so they will be taught not to blaspheme. So this is true, something that can happen to us. And now let's go to 1 Corinthians 5, 5. So you may be thinking, you know, what does that mean? It's, it's certainly a warning. We, we don't want that, right? So 1 Corinthians 5, 5. And so we're kind of the same situation, a little different, but basically someone ha- has been having this sin that they were in, and it was a terrible sin. So 1 Corinthians 5, 5. So notice Paul says, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. But notice the last part. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So we can say one thing, that being turned over to Satan is not being sent to hell. So that his spirit may be saved. But this is not a good thing. We do not want to be turned over to Satan, right? And that's what it says right here. That if we fall away, if we walk away, we will be turned over to Satan. And of course, I have no idea what that means. I mean, maybe, maybe Brett knows, I don't know. But it's definitely not something that we want to have happen. So there's a lot of death that can happen because of our sin and the choices that we make. So point C, you might experience death suddenly through God's strong discipline. This is sometimes referred to as sin unto death. So sometimes, if, if, if you sin enough, God will just take you up to heaven. Right? He will just cut it off completely. And of course, that's, that's not good. That's not what we want. So sin, once again, it has a lot of consequences. So as Christians, let's not go back to sin. Right? We have such a higher calling. Grace, righteousness, Holy Spirit, faith. That is so much better than going back to death. So point D. So you might die because of, of, of the built-in results of sin as observed in the following verses. And so as I said before, if we sin, there is consequences for sin. My dad has told this one story. Um, I can't remember exactly, you know, all of it. But basically, there was this guy. I'm not sure if he's a pastor or if he was just a Christian. And he got super drunk one night. And then as he was walking home, he fell on a piece of glass and completely cut his hand off. And so, yeah, that's a terrible story, right? And, and, and I think the, the point of this is that, you know, God forgave that sin, right? He always forgives sin, but there are still consequences for that sin, right? He lost his hand. In the same way, I think for me, Maybe a little bit. I, I, I didn't lose my hand, right? I still have hands, at least for now. But um, for me, when I was maybe a few years ago, you guys have heard about my, you know, my car stories, right? My amazing times with the police and stuff like this. But a few years ago, I ended up actually crashing and totally wrecking my car. And I think that was because I was sinning and the Lord was trying to wake me up. I think that was really personally what I thought was happening. So sometimes in life, when we have consequences, realize that God is trying to wake us up and of course, you always forgive that sin, but there's still consequences to the sin that we decide to do. And notice, you know, Hebrews 12, right? God, or, or God disciplines, or he, he, those whom he loves, he disciplines. And so with discipline, it, the point is to allow us to maybe grow more into Christ, to allow us to follow Christ more. So, and of course, as we're all sons, the Lord will discipline us. He will show us the right way. And sometimes that'll be through trial, through tribulation, but the goal is, when we're disciplined, when we go through consequences, is to turn back to God and to stop that certain sin. So really, uh, the Lord, He disciplines us to make us more Christ-like, to make us better in our walks. But once again, right, sin, there's consequences, and it leads to death. And if it leads to death, why are we doing it, right? Let's not go back to death. There is so much more better things in Jesus Christ in life, right? Life is far greater than death. So point C, Romans eight thirteen b so God promises that if by the Holy Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 
Once again, the Holy Spirit allows us to live the Christian life in a way that is pleasing to God. So point one, we do not put to death the deeds of the body by our own willpower. It's not what we can do to the Holy Spirit. So this is a matter of faith, not works. As we walk by faith and count on our union with Christ and His death to sin and His resurrection to newness of life, we are actually applying Christ's death to the deeds of our bodies. So once again, as we've talked in Romans 6 and on the board there, it's not about us trying to put to death the sin nature. The battle has already been won. God or Jesus Christ on the cross has already won the battle for us. He's already defeated the sin nature. We're now dead in that relationship. So it's not about us just trying to force ourselves not to sin. It's by faith, believing that what he did on the cross to sin is true of us. Right? He died to sin. We no longer have to sin because Jesus Christ died to sin. Do we believe that? Hopefully, we do. Now, point two. By faith, we count on the fact that in Christ we die to the sin nature, which is the root of all sinful deeds. So notice, by faith, we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to the sin nature. And because he's died to the sin nature, we no longer have to follow the sin nature. Right? He has died to the sin nature once again. So point three. Not only are we dead to sin in Christ, but God has also given us His Spirit. So it is by the power of God through the Holy Spirit within us that we are able to put to death the deeds of the flesh. So Romans 6, you know, we count on that by faith, but what allows us to count on those things by faith is the power of the Holy Spirit. He gives us power to be able to walk by faith and to be pleasing to God. Right? Faith and the Holy Spirit, they go together. So point four, so the phrase, you will live, is important. So living according to the flesh brings death. But on the other hand, living according to the Spirit brings life. Once again, right, death is the flesh. It's not good. No one wants to die. But life is through the Holy Spirit. So point A, as an example of living abundantly, Paul wrote, For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth so that we have, or we have no need to say anything. So in this church, they were doing a good job, right? Paul said we have no need to say anything. Point B, the Thessalonian, or Thessalonian believers were clearly living by means of the Holy Spirit's enabling power, and their testimony was expanding powerfully, right? Isn't that what we all should want? That, that we live our life in a way that is pleasing to the Lord, that our testimony is expanded to all people, right? That everyone sees that we are Christians, and when they see that we are Christians and we are following the Lord, who do they see ultimately? They see Jesus Christ through us, right? So as Christians, we should really have that idea of being ambassadors for Christ, being a good testimony to people in the outside world. Because when they see us following the Lord, walking by the Holy Spirit, you know, counting ourselves to be dead to sin and alive unto God, what do they see? They see Jesus Christ within us. And of course, we know everyone in the world, they need Jesus Christ. So th- there's a lot of reasons to walk by the Spirit, you know, and, and, and we've been seeing that. Point D, Romans eight fourteen, and, l- and let's read that one. So let's read verse 14. And if someone could just read that for me. So Romans eight fourteen. Thank you, J.G. And yeah, so notice, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, so those who are consistently walking by the Holy Spirit, being led by the Holy Spirit, these are the sons of God. And we're going to kind of discuss this a little bit. So not only will walking according to the Spirit result in abundant life, consistently walking, notice, consistently. It's not once in a while. It's not on Sunday. It's not on Monday. Just once in a while, it's consistently walking according to the Spirit. Right, 24-7, realizing that it's His power that allows us to live the Christian life, right? It's consistently. So consistently walking according to the Spirit will result in maturity. It's like if you guys have... Do you, do you, does anyone here play sports? Right? And to be good at sports, right, you have to practice, right? You don't just show up and you're automatically good, right? You have to practice, right? And so in the same way, and you have to practice consistently. If you just practice once in a while, you're not going to be good at that sport. So in the same way in the Christian life, we have to consistently 
count on these things by faith. We have to consistently walk by the Holy Spirit to be mature. And of course, as Christians, that should be our goal. Maturity, right? Would you rather be immature or mature? I mean, maybe some people want to be immature, but that probably wasn't a good question. But of course, as Christians, we want to be mature believers, those who are in service to the Lord. And so it takes a consistent walk. It takes discipline, right? Consistently walking according to the Holy Spirit. So point one in this verse, Paul was not casting doubt on the salvation of those believers who were not being consistently led by the Holy Spirit in their lives. Rather, he was making a practical distinction between mature and immature sons. So point two, the word Paul used in this verse for sons generally speaks of sons who are considered mature and responsible. So Jesus used this term when he describes himself as the son of God and the son of man. So when you see this term, it means mature. Generally, it means mature in Greek. So point three, only believers who are guided by the Holy Spirit in their daily lives are mature, responsible sons. So let's just read this again, and I'll kind of inject that in there. So verse 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the mature sons of God. Right? So it's mature. Not saying that if you, if, if you don't, you're not a Christian, but saying if you do, then you are a mature son, and you're one who is following the Lord consistently in our walks. So point four in Romans eight sixteen through 17, the more general term, sons, or technon, is translated children. So technon generally describes any offspring. So John 1, 12 reads, But as many as received him, to, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So in verse 16 through 17, we see a different word, and that's probably referring more to just being a child of God, being saved, to those who believe in his name. And real quick, what is the gospel again? Yeah, so he died for our sins, he rose again on the third day, he did everything that was ever needed on the cross, and what is our response? What do we do with that message? How do we react to the message? We believe on that message. Once again, that's the gospel. We believe in what Jesus Christ did on the cross 2,000 years ago. We believe in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Now let's read verses 15 through 17. So notice, for you have, let's just read verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So the Holy Spirit within us, it's not a spirit of slavery or fear, but it's a spirit of adoption as sons. So the Holy Spirit should give us assurance as, adop- as being adopted as sons. You know, and a lot of times in teaching and Bible and just when people go through the Bible, they encourage people by what? By fear. They encourage people with fear of hellfire or just this idea that, oh, if you don't do these things, you were never saved. And so a lot of the times Christianity is dumbed down to being scared of certain things. And that's the motivation for the Christian life. That's how a lot of people teach that. And that is totally contrary to what the Bible teaches. And exactly, even here, right, the Holy Spirit is not of fear. It's of adoption as son. It's of good things. It's of being secure in your position as Christ. Do you know that Jesus Christ wants you to know that you are a child of God? He doesn't want you to question it. He wants you to know that you are saved. Because if we know that we are saved, then we can walk in light of that. And so that's important. So however, whether we are led by the Spirit or not, all believers are accepted as God's dear children. So point A, Romans 8, 15 For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So as a believer, you should live in the truths of Romans 8 rather than in the self-condemnation described in the last section of Romans 7. Point 1, Romans 8, 15a. Notice, for you have not received a spirit of slavery. So God does not want you to have the mindset of a slave trying to survive by keeping rules and regulations, right? If you're doing that, that's not the true Christian life. Remember Matthew 11, I think I read it yesterday, right? His yoke is easy and his burden is light. So if we're following, if we're walking by the Holy Spirit, if we're living the true Christian life, it should result in joy and peace and grace. Not in drudgery, not trying to force myself, not doing things that I don't want to do. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is walking by these things by faith, and that should produce peace joy and love. Good things, right? Not of slavery, but of peace, love, and joy. You know, things that are much better. 
So point two, Romans 8, 15b. Notice, leading to fear again. So living by the law leads to fear of punishment. Although God disciplines his children, we never have to fear eternal punishment because Jesus Christ took our punishment on himself on the cross. And so I like the story that Cody tells when he discusses this. For example, if you're in a family, what would be more productive? What would be a better family situation? If all the time as a kid, your parents told you, I'm going to kick you out of the house if you do this wrong thing, would that be a, a good relationship that the, the, the parent is telling I'm going to kick you out of the house? No, right? That would be a very unfruitful relationship. What would be better? A, a, a better would be if the parents are like, you know, we accept you, you're beloved, you are in us, you're a part of our family. That's a far better relationship, right? That makes far more sense than always trying to make people scared of if they're truly saved. And so I think Jesus Christ wants us to know that, that we are a part of him, we are saved, we are the beloved of God, we are in Jesus Christ 100%. And once we put our faith in him, we know that we are in Jesus Christ, that we are a part of that family. Point three, Romans eight fifteen c But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons. So as God's child, you have been free from the tyranny of bondage to the law. So point A, the term adoption is derived from the Greek word and the place, meaning to be placed as a son or adopted. In a Greco-Roman family, you could only inherit if you were legally adopted in this way. So the point is, we're adopted into the family of Jesus Christ. And once we're in that family, nothing can separate us from being in that family. It's like, for example, I think we've said this before, but if I told my dad that he is no longer my dad, does that make any sense? Does that make it true? No. Right? He's still my father. So once again, all of us, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, God is our father, and that will never change. That is a fact that the Bible clearly teaches. Right? Once we're saved, we are part of that family. Nothing will be able to separate us from that family. So point B, many times a biological son will not be legally adopted by his father. Such a son would never experience the spirit of belonging in the family, nor would he receive an inheritance from his father. And point C, Paul's point here is that all believers have been given a spirit of adoption. As a believer, you have been legally adopted and have the full rights of a legitimate heir of God. And so I kind of want to discuss this kind of last part. Notice, so you have a spirit of adoption as sons, verse 15, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And then now let's read verse 16. So the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Holy Spirit within us testifies when it cries out to God, Abba, Father, that we are children of God. And so I think this kind of, you know, hinges on the fact, you know, we're saved, right? But how do we know we're saved? What is the assurance of our salvation, you know? We know that if we believe in Jesus Christ, we are saved, but how do we really know? And I think, first of all, let's go to John eleven twenty six through 27, and then we'll go to 1 John five thirteen as well. But John eleven twenty six through 27. Let's start in verse 25, actually. So John 11, verse 25 through 27. And this is how, first of all, this is how we know that we are saved. And so verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. So notice, if you believe in him, you will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So if you believe in Jesus Christ and what he did, you will never die. That's, first of all, the assurance we have as believers. If we believe in what Jesus Christ did on the cross, we are saved and we will never die. And let's go to also 1 John 5, 13. So 1 John 5, 13. And John is writing, and he said, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So how do we know? Because we believe in the name of the Son of God. So we know that we're saved. We know that we have the Holy Spirit within us. We know we have eternal life if we believe in Jesus Christ. First of all, that is the most important way to know that we are saved if we believe in Jesus Christ. So all of us in this room, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we can know absolutely that we are saved. That's, that's really the point. But also, in this verse... 
the Holy Spirit, when it cries out, Abba, Father, it's kind of a, just a little cool thing, right? It kind of shows us that we are saved as well. So first of all, once imp it's important to know that we're saved by believing, and we can know that, that we are saved forever, but also the Holy Spirit within us kind of, you know, lets us know that we are saved as well. So think of it this way. When we are going through a hard time and we cry out to God, that could be a sign that the Holy Spirit is working within us. You know, or when we're praying and we're brought to tears, that's a sign that the Holy Spirit is within us. Or, you know, just when we go through anything hard and our first response is to turn to the Lord and to turn to God, that is a sign of the Holy Spirit crying within us. So I think it's definitely not, you know, don't take this as saying, oh, if this doesn't happen, that means you're not saved. But kind of take this as a cool thing that can kind of encourage us, right? That, if, of course, we're saved by believing and we can know that. But also, when the Holy Spirit is within us, when we have troubles and we cry out to God, that's the Holy Spirit within us. So that's kind of a, just, I guess, maybe a secondary confirmation that we truly are saved. And it's an encouraging thing, right? And so that's something that we can take from that. And now point four, Romans 8, 15b, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So confidence, confidence in your position as God's beloved child should lead you to experience intimacy with the Lord in your daily life. If God seems distant, you're missing this important sense of belonging that is available to all God's children. Point B, Romans 8, 16. So the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So your new birth gave you a new identity as a child of God. One of the practical ministries of the Holy Spirit is to assure you of this fact. So the Holy Spirit assures us that we are saved. A lot of times as Christians, if we're walking away, if we're walking by the flesh, we lose our assurance. So that's why it's important to be in the Holy Spirit so that we can gain the assurance that comes from the Holy Spirit. So point two, or point one, when we walk according to the Spirit, we readily hear the witness of the Holy Spirit confirming our place in the family. But when we walk according to the flesh, we easily revert to the mindset of a fearful slave. So point two, we can never exit the family of God, but we can lose a sense of belonging. Insecurity is debilitating, and it is not God's will for any believer's life. So even though Jesus loved all the disciples equally, we should have the attitude of the Apostle John, who described himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now let's read the final verse, Romans eight seventeen. So verse 17... Notice, and of children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. So your union with Christ guarantees in inheritance. Point one, not only are all believers God's children, regardless of whether or not they are carnal or mature, we are all legal heirs. So as Christians, all of us, and we see this, and we see this in Ephesians 1.11, we all have an inheritance in heaven waiting for us. First Peter 1 talks about that as well, right? As Christians, we all have an inheritance, and that inheritance is greater than anything we can ever imagine, right? It's, it's unfading, it's undefiled, you know, it's just an amazing thing we have as Christians. So look to that inheritance, right? Look to that. Look, look at heaven. Look to things that are in heaven that are far better than things that are on this earth. And point two, your inheritance is not to be confused with rewards positions or crowns because those are all earned and not guaranteed so as a christian we know we're saved by believing we're born in the family of god and as believers all of us have an inheritance in jesus christ but also there's this idea of rewards and i've touched on it before so we all have an inheritance but also there's rewards that we can gain as christians in heaven if we walk faithfully in the lord and let's go to james 1 verse 12 we can see an example of a reward but notice, this isn't about gaining our salvation. This is something that we have as Christians after we become saved. So this is nothing to, This is not about inheriting eternal life. It's about receiving a reward for faithful service on the earth. So James 1, verse 12. So James 1, verse 12, and it said, Notice... Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So this isn't about inheriting eternal life. This isn't about being saved. It's about receiving a crown in heaven based on what 
we do if, if we love the Lord. And so what it says, if we persevere under trial, if we love the Lord, we will receive this crown in heaven. So there's a distinction. So first of all, the Christian, we have an inheritance in heaven. We're going to be in heaven for sure. But there's also another side where there's a reward that we can gain in heaven due to faithful service on earth. So not everything is guaranteed, but certainly our inheritance in heaven is guaranteed. But rewards, things like that, that is not guaranteed. It's dependent on how we walk our Christian lives. So point D, Romans 8, 17b. So as legally adopted sons and daughters, we are joint heirs with Christ. So all he has inherited, we have co-inherited with him. This blessing is 100% undeserved, but it, but it is guaranteed due to our union with Christ. So because of what Christ has done, we now have all these amazing things. And point E, Romans 8, 17 C. If indeed we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. So since being a child of God includes the honor of partaking in Christ's sufferings, Paul assured us we will likewise partake in his glory. So point one, here Paul used a less common condition statement, if indeed, meaning if so or since indeed. We see this condition statement in Romans 3.30 where it is translated sense indeed. So we can say, so sense indeed we will suffer, not necessarily if, it's saying sense indeed we will suffer, then we will also be glorified. So something, something is true of us because it is true of Christ. So this verse can be understood as sense indeed we suffer with him. It stands to reason we will also share in his glory. Point three, in other words, Paul was not inferring that only those believers who suffer will be glorified. Rather, he was assuring all believers that since they suffer with Christ, they will one day be glorified with him, as we observe in the following verses. So he's not saying if, he's saying since. And so if you think about it, the Bible has a promise to you that you will suffer. It's not something that maybe happen. It will happen. All of us will suffer. And so he's saying if you suffer with him, you will be glorified. And since we will suffer with him, we will also be glorified with him. Point four, the logic is that if you suffer with someone, it is reasonable to expect to share in their honors. So, for example, just think of life. Have you ever suffered something with someone? You know, something hard? You know, with a friend, maybe, with a family member? Right? If you suffer with someone, right, that draws you closer to that person, right? We see that, right? And just think of war. You know, you know soldiers that go to war, and they go through all this hardship, all these terrible things, right? They suffer together, and they grow a lot closer. So suffering, and we're going to see, you know, in, in verses 18 and all the way through the rest of it, it draws us closer to God. It allows us to be more Christ-like, right? It, it, it's just kind of this thing that allows us to become more like Christ, really to draw us together with Christ. And so, um, kind of as a summary, I know we went through a lot. I was going through two sections, but I, I think the point is, and this is kind of the last discussion on sanctification, but the point is, right, all of us in this room, we have a choice. What are we going to do? Are we going to walk by the flesh? Or are we going to reap death? Or are we going to walk by the Spirit and reap eternal life, right? And once again, what is far better? The Holy Spirit is far better. And so if you really want to live the best life you can ever live, the only life that ever matters, it is through walking by the Holy Spirit, walking by faith, trusting in what Jesus Christ has done by means of the Holy Spirit. So I encourage you guys, right, not to go back to the flesh, that is death, but through the Holy Spirit, there is life. So as we move forward, as we go through, the, as we're done with this conference, you know, a lot of times you go to a conference, you know, you learn a lot of good things, and then you go home. I've done this before, and then you just, you know, put it all the waste. You just don't care about it, right? Hopefully, you guys can see that a life lived by the Holy Spirit is far better than anything else. So let's walk by the Holy Spirit. Let's not walk by the flesh. And I will close in prayer. So, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for your Son and the death on the cross. And I want to thank you for the Holy Spirit as well, which is given to each and every one of us, Lord, is a seal that, that says that eventually we will be glorified, Lord. So I pray that we would um, just understand that, realize the truth of that. I pray that we would apply that truth, that we would understand that the importance of walking by the Spirit, walking in the power of you, and not our own power, and really using that to fulfill your plan for us. In your name, amen.